Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. आप हमारी पीपी की देख पाएंगे और ये भी देख पाएंगे. Hello. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Nanotechnology, thin polymer film, nanocomposites, 
and devices in energy, etc. He has published more than 300 peer group papers and 50 patents. Professor Sharma is a recipient of several highly accredited awards and honors. Some of them include Infosys Prize in Engineering and Computer Sciences, Tor Science Prize, DC Post Fellowship, that's a Bhatnagar Award, Omidhi Bhava Award, Syed Hussain Jahir Medal, Meghna Saha Medal, and so on. Speed list. Professor Sharma is fellow of all the three national academies in India and is also a fellow of World World Academy of Sciences. And uh, he has uh, been serving as uh, editor, associate editor, and editor board member in several national and international journals. So it's a very great privilege for the society to welcome Professor Sharma uh, in this uh, plenary session and I request all of you to welcome him by giving an applause. <laughs> we are very grateful to you Professor Sharma for giving your time uh, to us and uh, agreeing to deliver this plenary lecture. Now the floor is yours Professor Sharma. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm sorry that we are starting out a little bit late. There is also an echo. Can you please turn off your mic on your side? Please turn off all your mics on your side. Great. Uh, so, okay, we got rid of echo. Uh, this being the first talk of the day, uh, we can expect to encounter some technical difficulties. Uh, you know, these are just lights and shadows of technology. Uh, but I am very, very glad that the International Society uh, for Energy, Environment and Sustainability is holding this very important international conference on sustainable energy and environmental challenges. Uh, let's go to the first slide. Can you please put on the slide? Hello? Organizers, can you please put on the slide? Yes, sir. Uh, can you and can you maximize that so I can see it? Uh, 
Can you do you see it on full screen? The slide. Yes, the, the slide is in full screen. You have it on full yes. screen, but I I have it in a little window, so I cannot. See. Um. Do Do you know how I can put it on the full screen so that I can? Okay, I I see it now. Wonderful. Um. Okay, there we go. Uh, so so what I want to talk about first of all, I'm very happy to note that there are so many compelling themes in this particular conference, uh, which ranges from the future of IC engines uh, and their technology roadmap to the fuels for sustainable transport, combustion of various uh, different kinds, uh, engine spray, coal biomass, combustion, sustainable energy from carbon neutral sources, air pollution, climate change, water, biological waste treatment, bioenergy, biofuels, microbial processes and products, and thermochemical processes for biomass. This is indeed a very wide canvas, uh, and these are all the very, very compelling themes that would continue to impact all of us for all the foreseeable future. Uh, so I want to congratulate the organizers for making this a very, very important conference and having such a good participation from across the globe. Uh, people who are joining us, I want to congratulate them uh, for being partners uh, in this very important journey. Uh, next. Okay, so while all of you are experts in the area uh, that that we, the, which are the themes of this conference, so I would not belabor those points. Uh, indeed, what I want to talk about very quickly uh, is basically some of the processes and the structure and the architecture of doing good science and technology. Uh, so this is not related only to a particular theme of this or that conference, but giving some examples, uh, the challenges and opportunities that come in the future, including in the sustainable development and the technologies that we would need for it. Uh, so the first aspect uh, that, that I want to illustrate with a couple of examples uh, is a uh, is the power of uh, uh, power of lateral thinking, creativity, uh, and even common sense that we may call scientific common sense. Uh, creativity is all about connecting the dots of knowledge, which have not been connected before. Uh, so it, this becomes even more important for sustainability, uh, the climate change, and the aspects that we are considering. Uh, this is not simply a matter of analysis because these are multidimensional problems. In other words, we need hugely interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, out of disciplinary, or transdisciplinary thinking. Not as a lip service, but really uh, as, as teams, as the people who want to solve problems, uh, not simply a tool centric approach, but a problem centric approach. Uh, so uh, creativity, to my mind, is connecting those dots, those silos of knowledge, which have not been connected before. And these are not only dots uh, of, uh, of science and, and engineering and technology, but also social sciences and humanities. And indeed, connecting to all stakeholders of society. This is so, so important because we are not talking a particular technology. We are also talking about the larger issues, the overarching issues of sustainability, uh, which also requires not only science and technology, but its uh, diffusion, its acceptability, its awareness, uh, its reflection in the policies, uh, in the rules and regulations, in the laws, indeed in the will of society. So uh, let me start with uh, next slide. Let me start with an example, a couple of examples of creativity, lateral thinking, out of box thinking, and how that becomes important in solving problems of today and tomorrow. Uh, the first example is um, uh, the, the invention and indeed innovation of a scanning, tunneling microscope and atomic force microscope uh, the inventions which uh, got some of the fastest Nobel Prize in the history of science. Uh, so uh, what is atomic force microscope, scanning tunneling microscope? 
basically it is to see very small things at nano and sub nanometer scales on a surface and so in order to see something very small um uh, no, go go back to the last uh, slide uh in order to see something very small uh, you know when we think about the concept of seeing we think about light we think about radiation uh, for example an electron microscope would work on electron beam because got very small wavelength Okay, uh, did you get me back? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I will quit the camera. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, hopefully that th this would proceed better now that I have quit the camera. Uh, okay, so what we were saying is, uh, look, I don't know where we were lost. I was saying that there is another way of seeing without light or without radiation, and that way of seeing is if we close our eyes, we take a stick and we tap on the surface as moving, like a visually challenged person would. Uh, so that by tapping that stick on the surface and moving, I can make a visual map of the surface in my mind. Uh, if we were to translate that in terms of technology for seeing small things, uh, it basically I would make a micro stick. Uh, next slide. Uh, I will make a micro cantilever or a micro stick, uh, and then you know drag it on the surface, uh, and that way I can create a map of the surface. And uh, this is basically how uh, scanning, tunneling, microscopy, and atomic force microscopy work. The whole idea is uh, that in today's world, uh, we are basically limited by new concepts. If I can think of a new concept, uh, translating it, uh, you know, requiring the technology which is needed for it, that's usually not a problem. So the limiting step in doing new science, in doing exciting science, in new discoveries, in making new technology, often the limiting step, the bottleneck, uh, is a new concept. So, um, uh, can you go back? I think you skipped a couple of, uh, yeah, next one. Uh, next slide, next, next slide, next. Okay, another, um, uh, well, this example is from my own group. Um, basically, when you want to do nano fabrication or nano manufacturing, there are two ways of doing it, top-down methods, uh, which require uh, nano tools of fabrication, for example, iron beams, lithography of different kinds, uh, and, and so on, uh, 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 top-down methods. The bottom-up methods are based on self-assembly and self-organization. So in addition to these two methods, we were thinking, look, is there a third method for nano fabrication? Uh, and so I recalled a movie we had seen in 1980s a very popular movie 
uh, which is called honey i shrunk the kids uh, basically means that if you can make something big let's say you can make something as a 10 micron object and if we can shrink it then we can make something smaller so that could become a third method of nano fabrication so it looks like an outrageous idea but the whole point is sometimes we should think outrageous think out of box and often these ideas could be translated into reality because as i pointed out technology engineering and design today in today's world are often not the bottlenecks uh, it is the lack of new ideas okay so this is an example i say look if i want to make something complex something three dimensional but i want to make a 100 nanometer object which would be very very difficult to make with iron beams and whole lot of top down methods so to do that would be let's make that object on 10 micron scale and shrink it next slide now okay how do you shrink it next slide how do you shrink it well it's really simple because you make an object which is bigger with conventional methods of micro machining uh, and then make a replica by molding in a gel uh, and that gel can be dried so the gel shrinks one can make another molding another cycle of shrinking repeat the process which can be done even in a high school lab you can repeat it 10 times uh, so that one would keep shrinking the original object until one gets the desired uh, size of that object so anyway this is just a, as a illustration uh, of the fact that we can connect different dots of knowledge uh, we can think outrageous we can think out of box and whole lot of time uh, the people are looking for new ideas they are not necessarily looking for uh, incremental work uh, incremental work which could be done with you know large amount of infrastructure uh, which could be done really anywhere in the world uh, okay next slide um, i will not have time to talk about lots of these examples uh, but the point is um, okay well uh, the future of science technology and indeed what kind of stuff we need to focus on in the new millennium now we know that of the future uh, predictions are very hard especially about the future and everything looks uh, you know predictable in hindsight uh, i doubt that 30 years ago i could have predicted the world in which we live i still remember uh, the first email uh, that i i sent in 1982 on an experimental system connecting different universities in the us uh, and it was so not long time ago that we looked at the rise of internet the rise of google the uh, rise of uh, cell phones and so on uh, anyhow uh, so the future let us talk a little bit about the future and what are the overarching challenges and what are the challenges and opportunities next now uh, of course that um, this is not a catalog of technologies that would arrive it's not a catalog of products that would arrive but is more about uh, what is it what kind of stuff we need to do in order to be prepared for the future which is about preparing the ground next uh, if we have interest in looking at the kind of technologies that might be coming around the kind of technologies which are needed um i can refer you to this uh, technology vision 2035 which was prepared by uh, one of the arms of department of science and technology government of india uh, this is a technology vision 2035 uh, there are also 11 sectoral reports uh, these sectors they range uh, from water energy health transport whole lot of things like that so if we wanted to look at the specific examples of where technology is going what kind of products uh, are likely to emerge and what are the needs indeed uh, so i can refer you happily to this report which is downloadable uh, from this site of tifec uh, so beyond that of course the, there was an earlier report which was technology vision 2020 Uh, which was prepared under the chairmanship of dr abdul kalam and if you were to look at that report you see that some of those uh, things about future 
have come true in 2020, but a whole lot of them have not come true. And this is the basic nature of future. So no matter what we think about the future, future will always be a little bit more surprising than how we think about it. Next. Now, one of the things which are the compelling themes in future uh, is to learn from nature because nature uh, is a storehouse of very, very important, very exciting technologies. Uh, I give some simple examples here that my group has worked on over decades. The colors, the very vibrant colors that we see in nature, uh, for example, butterfly wings and peacock feathers, uh, we, we see these uh, leaves and feathers which are totally water repellent, super hydrophobic surfaces. If you look at uh, ceramics, which are made in nature, uh, they are made at room temperature. They are made at uh, atmospheric pressure. Unlike the very, uh, very uh, extreme conditions uh, that uh, human technologies use uh, to make ceramics. Moreover, a whole lot of stuff that happens in nature there are a lot of inspiration from there, um, uh, not only in terms of materials, but also in terms of manufacturing, not only in terms of manufacturing, but also in terms of uh, uh, the principles, uh, the wisdom, uh, the mechanisms and so on. So this remains actually a very, very uh, inexhaustible source of new technologies. Often we are not in our science, in our technology development, we don't pay sufficient attention to understanding how things happen in nature. Uh, just to give you an example, this is something very new. In the last 10, 15 years, people have figured out how geckos and insects and spiders, they stick to surfaces and walk around. There is no man-made adhesive which can perform as well. Uh, because, you know, all the man-made adhesives, they are not reusable. Uh, once you stick a poster and peel the tape, you cannot use it again. But you look at how, you know, geckos, uh, lizards and all that, uh, they keep uh, sticking, but they keep moving for the rest of their lives. So imagine if we were to make all these products, uh, th this would be so great. And there's a whole lot new understanding of all of these phenomena in nature and how to translate them uh, in terms of products and technologies. Next. Uh, let us have a quick look at actually how science technology uh, shapes society and how the aspirations of society then shape science and technology. And a whole lot of it is related to the rise of industry from zero to industry 4.0 uh, that we have now, uh, as well as the, the different kind of societies that it shapes. For example, society 5.0 and beyond. Now, this is industry zero was simply based on uh, some metallurgy, uh, metallurgy, fire, wheel, and some basic stuff like that, but basically dependent on the flow of muscle. So essentially, these are period of barbarians. Uh, you have a sword, you walk in, you take whatever you like from wherever. Uh, okay. Uh, and so that basically you can say was the rise of industry zero. Going to industry one, uh, basically driven by the steam power, which means centralized industry, uh, which means uh, a lot of dislocation in the society. A man folks basically go wherever coal mines are, wherever big factories based on steam power are set up. Industry two is based on um, the, the rise of electrical power, which means all the machines and everything got into our homes. Uh, you know, they are distributed. Uh, so the manufacturing is distributed, the use of machines is distributed, uh, and then finally, industry three, we have seen in our own lives, this is the digital age, but passive digital age, which means, of course, information becomes very important. And if we were to go to industry 4.0, industry 4.0 and beyond, all the foreseeable future of humans on planet Earth, it's about a convergence of different streams of technology and knowledge. What are these streams? Uh, so, you know, at different times is the flow of energy, the control of energy, the control of materials and machines that determines, uh, you know, what are the features of that industrial revolution. But now in Industry 4.0 and beyond, it is a flow of data, which is now the new raw material. 
the flow of information and knowledge which controls everything okay so uh, now the future is about the convergence of knowledge and different streams of technology and these streams of technology include uh, next it includes um, uh, the communication 5g and beyond computing co distributed computing computing on the edge computing everywhere computing and communication which is embedded in materials uh, it doesn't matter if i'm a chemist chemical engineer mechanical engineer electrical engineer if i'm a physicist if i'm a material scientist all of that means that there is a great deal of convergence of all of this communication computing uh, autonomous decision making by artificial intelligence machine learning autonomous perception by sensors pulling in the information which is required uh, from different sources uh, an arm load of data and making decisions based on that uh, as well as autonomous action through actuators other words are coming together of cyber and digital on one hand and physical on the other hand now going forward in the future another dimension that would add to it would be biological so right now we are looking in the we are, we are going to be starting we are starting uh, on the age of cyber physical systems now so of course it, it has implications for uh, the themes of this conference uh, it doesn't matter if you call combustion uh, you know clean energy uh, the energy networks all of that is going to embed all of these elements so uh, going forward of course the integration of biological so the cyber physical entities uh, would get into biological entities and some of the biological entities uh, like for example tissues and cells and organs they will get into the digital physical space that integration on the research front has already started and uh, you, we would see actually industries uh, which would come up based on that so this is uh, one of the very exciting future uh, frontiers and challenges and this is going to impact everything that we do next it's going to impact our learning skills education i don't have time clearly of course to go into all of that but all of these um, bullets uh, they are uh, actually a universe in themselves so it's going to you know what are these challenges and how do we prepare for them and what kind of changes it would bring uh, it's in terms of learning skills education the future of work and monitoring of that work uh, some of that basically means losing our personal space uh, governance experience and entertainment mental health judiciary very important commerce of course medicine privacy safety media and of course um, uh, the the justice systems and equalities and inequalities there are both centripetal and centrifugal forces uh, which are unleashed uh, by the new technologies uh, next okay so of course uh, in india as globally uh, we are addressing start to address these issues uh, there is a new cyber physical mission which has been um, launched by department of science and technology last year this is worth about uh, well in terms of purchase power parity globally this is worth about 1.5 billion us dollars about half a billion dollars in indian rupees uh, and it has already set up 25 hubs across the country uh, the mission on quantum technologies and systems is coming up rapidly uh, they, uh, which is worth about more than a billion US dollars in terms of purchase power parity, three billion US dollars. A supercomputing mission, which is more than worth about half a billion dollar uh, in rupee terms. Uh, uh, the supercomputing mission is setting up 50 supercomputers which are networked across the nation. All of these, actually, all, all of these technologies hunt in pairs today. We, we must never think that a particular technology, a particular stream of science is an isolated stream. All the technologies, they hunt in pairs. In fact, they hunt in dozens together. So, so it is about creating a seamless ecosystem, uh, which takes into account the rise of cyber physical, 
uh, going into biological, the quantum technologies of computing, communication, quantum algorithms, quantum materials, um, quantum um, uh, you know communication and computing. Uh, next. Of course, the second, the first overarching challenge, as I pointed out, is the rise of intelligent machines, uh, which is going to impact every aspect of my science and technology, my R&D, my invention and innovation ecosystem. A whole lot of, in fact, increasingly, even the basic science is going to be done with the help of tools of artificial intelligence. Uh, we have already come to see that happening more and more. A whole lot of uh, very interesting, very complex science, which is driven by data. Uh, we are going to see increasingly being done by machine learning. The second, of course, the biggest challenge, which is also directly related to this uh, conference, is on sustainability and climate. In other words, if you were to look at sustainable development goals, each of these goals actually requires uh, a, a suit of technologies. Uh, it requires a whole lot of understanding in terms of the basic science, but it also requires a suit of technologies uh, which uh, uh, would be necessary uh, in order to address the problem of sustainability. Of course, when we think about sustainable development, you know, you, sometimes, of course, there is a conflict. There's always been a conflict from industry one onwards on the goals of sustainability and development. This is because we interpret development in a narrow sense. We interpret, we equate development uh, with consumption of a certain kind. Uh, because of course, it's been known for 150 years that mindless consumption is good for development. I mean, or in that sense, defined in a very narrow sense. But now it's fairly clear uh, that you cannot have, uh, you know, sustainability and development uh, you know, especially so. Uh, you, you see the 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 places, the societies uh, which have attained that kind of economic development uh, now should focus much more on sustainability, whereas the societies which are still, in a sense, developing and and addressing the very basic needs of human beings, they need to focus more on development. Together, globally, we need to have a balance between sustainability and development. Uh, while doing that, while we're talking about technologies, all technologies have lights and shadows, uh, uh, lights and shadows. And a whole lot of time we don't, you know, all the problems that we have created related to climate and sustainability is simply because we work in silos. So I think uh, in terms of uh, when we, we think about something new, we are not paying attention to nexus. Nexus simply means if I'm paying attention to agriculture uh, or I'm paying attention to water, I must pay attention to agriculture equally well because 70% to 80% water is consumed in agriculture. So we cannot consider these things in isolation. Uh, similarly, if I'm considering energy, of course, there's a nexus of environment with everything. Okay, so nexus is very important. It's not just nexus. I mean, it basically means that they are very, very closely interrelated. And, and we it would be totally meaningless to talk about one of them without talking about their impact and internal correlation with other uh, things in its proximity. The life cycle analysis is very important, of course. And finally, I would conclude because of lack of time by saying that while science and technology and innovation are the pillars based on which we would address the problems of clean energy, water, climate change, waste, mobility, health, and all. Uh, these are necessary, but often not sufficient. And in that, I would like to quote uh, something that I read long time ago, but makes sense. which says, I used to think the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought with 30 years of good science, we could address those problems. But I was wrong. The top problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. So let me emphasize cultural aspect because I don't know what spiritual means. It could be misunderstood. And we scientists don't know how to do that. 
so you know of course it's not only about scientists uh, nobody in the society knows how to do that it doesn't matter if we are talking about scientist or businessman or what have you uh, okay so this is the major problem and without paying attention to it equally without integrating our science and technology in society at large we cannot hope to address these problems they will not be addressed so therefore different pillars that address these problems have to interact with each other they have to understand each other and work together okay and so these are different stakeholders uh, that have you know stakes uh, in all of this which is all of us the third challenge is basically going from invention to innovation so uh, historically most of our science and technology indeed everything we do in universities iits icers what have you basically is invention centric or discovery centric in some cases but we have not paid equal attention to innovation so innovation well whole lot of you know scientists i talk to they don't know the meaning of innovation the easiest way to explain innovation that innovation is opposite of invention now invention basically is a black box which uh, input to the black box is money and resources the output to the black box of invention uh, is knowledge we are you know are transmitting knowledge or creating new knowledge innovation on the other hand is 180 degree out of phase uh, with invention black box so innovation is the input to innovation is knowledge and output from the innovation black box uh, is uh, new socio economic opportunities and money so basically you can see input to invention is money output is knowledge innovation input is knowledge and output is money so in order to have sustainable knowledge ecosystem in society we need to have invention and innovation working together harmoniously and so it is about you know every technology that we talk about uh, that uh, you know create creating new knowledge that we talk about creation of new knowledge must satisfy couple of conditions for it to become innovative uh, which is that it has a direction it has a relevance you can push it and there is some pull for that knowledge so if we had these you know we keep that in mind while doing inventions while working on creating new knowledge this would connect very easily with the innovation ecosystem next okay we would not i think i'm running out of time of course we started about 15 minutes late uh, but i i don't want to belabor the point except to say that okay uh, you know innovation ecosystem um it, it is not like invention ecosystem is very different uh, so while invention ecosystem uh, we are doing well uh, uh, india for example is number 3 in the world in terms of number of scientific publications publications in you know peer reviewed journals um in um so that that's uh, it's okay you know given our constraints and inputs uh, for r and d and innovation but it has not been equally easy to translate all of that knowledge into new innovations so therefore you know just as we have universities we have iits and so on uh, in order to have invention one would need matching innovation ecosystems some of them are coming up uh, in last 10 years especially uh, for example business uh, incubators technology business incubators and startups and what have you uh, but lot more needs to be done in that and while thinking about innovation uh, you see india has great deal of advantages uh, this is about the diversity of india which means every kind of product and technology is really needed uh, the heterogeneity of the market if you would the uh, second strength is a demographic dividend which means a very young country uh, of very you know uh, educated young people uh, who are very energetic we are rolling up the sleeves in order to jump into action uh, leveraging all that strength and of course huge amount of market uh, a middle class and so on uh, and in fact a deep r&d uh, foundation uh, so in fact we know that all the you know global companies multinationals 
uh, most likely their second largest R&D and design center is somewhere in India. So it basically means that it's got, uh, you know, people, uh, the human resources uh, and a whole lot of uh, infrastructure and so on uh, to be able to do good quality R&D. Uh, next. Uh, the fourth challenge, if you would, uh, overarching challenge is about uh, diversity, inclusion and equity. Uh, I would be all aware of that. Uh, and I, I would simply say that I have not seen a bicycle without two wheels work very well. And I have not seen an effective bicycle which does not have two wheels except in circus. So if we wanted to have a society which is economically empowered uh, and also socially empowered, it is very, very clear that science and technology has to pay special, special attention. Uh, to diversity, inclusion, and equity. Uh, and a whole lot of work is being done in that direction. Next. Okay, so anyway, uh, if we were to, let's say, very quickly sum up the new processes of science and technology, the new mind of scientists, if you would, uh, it is about shift from tool-centric or discipline-centric or department-centric technology to problem-centric uh, science and technology. Uh, it is more about integration and synthesis and not only about analysis. Unfortunately, it is the tools of analysis which we emphasize in our training and education. Uh, creativity, of course, is very important. Developing common sense and intuition. And it is all about the convergence and co-arising of technologies. No matter how great an idea I have, no matter how great a technology I have, it would not find acceptance unless there is a whole field which has been prepared for it, which has been irrigated for it, and so on. There are so many concrete examples of that. Um, and it's always good to remember that my success depends on the success of everybody who is around us. And of course, uh, our capacity to negotiate change, uh, to liberate change, in fact, and we have seen a whole lot of that happening in COVID-19. Uh, it is uh, it's our adaptability, uh, it's our um, you know willingness to change, and in fact uh, to 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 get a new mileage out of that change, new opportunities out of that change. That is how we have to be on lookout for. So I'm sure the conference that we have today, uh, it would always be good to brainstorm, not not just have these structured sessions. I'm sure that the conferences of future, whole lot of that is about. Uh, is about uh, creating this dialogue about in my particular area what is happening uh, which would benefit from what is happening in the proximal areas and that happens when I talk to people who are not in my session uh, so this is very important that intermixing of ideas and saying look uh, how is it what are the new ideas which are coming uh, from different streams of knowledge next uh, so in order to have that mixing, in order to have, you know, forget our uh, our descriptions of departments and our descriptions of who I am, whether I'm a physical chemist, inorganic chemist, organic chemist, green chemist, red chemist, uh, biochemist, physical chemist, what have you. Right? To forget all these distinctions, in fact, to my mind, again, I now have time to go into it, but to say that all of science and technology, in fact, could be uh, can be uh, can be not fragmented in hundred different ways, but in fact there are only five M's that define all of science and technology, which is mechanics, which is understanding, uh, materials, uh, putting together things, devices, systems, machines, manufacturing, and of course the final thing we must not forget is the man herself. So it is these five M's that define actually. Uh, what we are doing in the science and technology uh, and you know this kind of classification rather than undergraduate teaching classification in terms of departments is far more helpful because we know that two people who work in fluid mechanics uh, one in mechanical engineering other in chemical third in aero all of them have much more in common with each other than two colleagues in the same department next and so what i pointed out is that the success of our science and technology efforts 
uh, would would depend very greatly uh, on translating them, empowering them also through policies, uh, through rules, indeed through the will of society. Uh, so there is a whole lot of uh, you know uh, a good there has to be a good interaction and understanding, uh, and in fact the lobbying and championing of science and technology in every uh, context, and especially when we talk about the context of this conference, all of these themes. They really, uh, you know, of course, they need technology, but what they need, uh, they need a right policies and implementation of those policies. Uh, so there's a new policy called national, uh, of course, education policy. We know a new policy coming up very soon uh, in science, technology and innovation policy for India 2021. There's a new policy on geospatial data surveying and mapping science and technology infrastructure and what I call scientific social responsibility. All of these uh, policies, um, I, you know, will talk uh, a whole lot of stuff that we are talking about here and, and saying, look, how do we empower our science and technology more uh, to work for our society? Um, next. Uh, okay, so often, you know, people talk about future. They say, look, wh what kind of products and technologies would emerge in the future? I often tell them, look, while we do not know exactly the form of the product or technology, but all of these are derived from the basic needs of the mind. Okay, and every single technology can be traced from there. So what are the, what is it that the mind wants forever to be healthy, to have quality of life, to be connected with equality, uh, whether you're talking about the rise of social media, the digital and so on. All of that is in response to that, to learn and to apply knowledge, to make decisions in complexity. Uh, the rise of machine learning, artificial intelligence uh, is partly in response to that need to be entertained. Uh, I mean, you know, I mean, in a broader context, not just movies, to have better life, to be happy, to find fulfillment, to create and control its own world. Uh, for example, the rise of augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, immersive reality, and so on, is in response to that need to live long, maybe to live forever. Uh, of course, the concept of digital twins and cyber twins and so on will be in response to that particular need. And of course, the mistake we have made all along is to equate happiness and the sense uh, of, um, of fulfillment with consumption. This has been a very fundamental mistake uh, unless we also address even as scientists uh, to, uh, to, to introduce some course correction in that. Uh, I'm afraid uh, that science technology alone would not find solution to the problems of climate change and so on. Next. Okay, I would just skip that because we're indeed out of time. Uh, because, okay, just say, okay, well, what is the short history of the future? Future is all about convergence. So essentially means that let's lose, uh, you know, our very strict and then very narrow identities because they are a little bit counterproductive uh, for the growth of science and technology in relevant directions with quality. Something that would satisfy the human mind, it will satisfy the needs of the society. So drivers and directions of technology are they are, by understanding minds, needs, demands, wants, desires, and if I may say so, greed. Not all demands can be fulfilled with technology alone, and this needs balancing. So it is actually, you know, sometimes you say, look, why we, you know, people ask me, look, why are you telling me all that? I'm just a scientist, right? So, you know, there, nothing would be a, a greater error to think that scientists have no role uh, in this balancing act, because if you know if we leave ourselves alone, nobody else is going to bother about us. So it is very clear that we need to have lobbying. We need to be championing uh, the cause of that science and technology, uh, which would solve the problems uh, of society. And we must remember there are lights and shadows of technology, which are reflected in when we do not consider nexus and life cycle analysis. Uh, also remembering in the future, and this would become very clear within the next three decades, that technology is a good servant, 
but is never a good master unfortunately people will willingly relinquish control and that we can see in everyday life whole lot of that happens uh, and this is because of the laziness of mind uh, so it is indeed keeping the mind alive and saying look there are some good things uh, you know that we were going to do with new technology but there you know there are something that one has to organize in our mind and in our society in order to able to keep technology under control next okay so i conclude there thank you very much uh, for listening um if there are any quick questions i am happy to address them thank you very much indeed professor sharma for sharing your thoughts on science and technology touching in great detail invention and innovation and also elaborating the future of technology you are bringing some cluster thought what could be the fruits and where the scientists should play the role so the floor is open for any question professor sharma has been very generous to take up the questions if there are any specific wanted questions you can take them from the audience Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Instructor Sir. Uh, my question is regarding the hydrogen. Like uh, in the in your slides, you showed that hydrogen can be strong, and uh, they can be uh, like they can be used as the miniatures. So, in the simplest process, does it lose the uh, its uh, minute details about the structural information? because hydrogen contains the water and uh, using the technology if we are sending it so does it lose the information on the structures like on the edge and other information which are very important thank you sir yeah i mean i not i'm not sure if i understood your question about loss of structure of hydrogen um okay now first of all uh, there is something i see i i can illustrate the shadow of technology so when i see myself in camera i see some shadow behind me dancing all the time and that you see is a shadow of the current digital technology and platform uh, that we use i am sure that we would lose this shadow uh, as immersive reality uh, you know conferences of this kind become more and more popular anyhow uh, the the point uh, of course uh, the ultimate solution to our clean energy problems uh is uh, going through the green hydrogen route uh okay i'm not saying that of course the fusion energy uh, may also be there and so on and maybe you know anyway everything is going to be remain a mix of whole lot of different things in the foreseeable future uh so it is not one one size that fits all but green uh, hydrogen which means making use of renewable energy in order to split water uh and therefore uh, you know rise of that entire hydrogen economy if you would so which is hydrogen production hydrogen storage hydrogen transportation uh, converting back hydrogen to useful forms of energy and so on so all of that of course has started to happen in a big way and i suspect that it would keep gathering a steam uh, as we go forward now your question um i don't know if it's coming from a chemist or is coming from a physicist or why you're saying okay if you split water does it change the structure of hydrogen is that what you were saying sir it was about hydrogen not hydrogen oh no hydrogen oh i thought you talking about clean energy <laughs> and hydrogel uh, what about hydrogel how oh, the drying okay they changed the no you see what happens is uh, when you dry hydrogel uh, basically uh, of course the water or the solvent uh, which is swelling the hydrogel uh, it evaporates so there could be physical changes in the hydrogel what that means is there could be micro cracks which are opening up there could also be uh, not not isotropic shrinkage of hydrogel right but these are technical problems and that's why it took about one month to optimize the conditions for drying of hydrogen and indeed what kind of gel that one would use uh, for for molding 
for micro molding, for nano molding, and so on. So those are, you know, these these, these are micro technical problems. Uh, and then, of course, that one has to work on it. Once you have an idea, of course, you know, to translate that in terms of a product or technology would take some little bit more time, few more steps, but those are all surmountable. Okay, I mean, if that's what you were asking about hydrogel and shrinkage, yeah. Any question? Yes, please. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, sir, I generally feel uh, there are two kind of uh, science laboratories in the country. One are the big, big national laboratories, and second are the small, small universities which are situated in the countryside. So, how those uh, people in those universities and colleges also want to do something, hmm. but I think there is no proper guidance in that all. So, how those uh, people working in small, small institutes in countryside can be brought to the mainstream? Yeah, it's a very good question and indeed a burning question. Uh, look, if, uh, you know, 80% or whatever number of our scientists are not empowered, if they are not totally strongly participating uh, in the scientific ecosystem, uh, then we are losing something. We are losing a great deal. And this is also the meaning, as I said, of diversity, inclusion and equity. So there are different kind of diversity and to have inclusion of that it requires different interventions and different actions no doubt so if you look at gender for example is one aspect of diversity very few women uh, i mean very disproportionately low number of women in science technology uh, similarly another inclusion and diversity that you pointed out in terms of you know some colleges state colleges universities and so on uh, which may not be equally empowered. Now, having stated the problem, uh, let's say, of course, the solutions uh, are kind of obvious. And some of them are now beginning to be implemented. Let me point out a few of them. Uh, the first, uh, of course, intervention which is needed is in order you know, for these other things to be connected to something which is more empowered. Uh, so if it's a standalone, a small unit, something, it has problems of identity. It has problems of connecting with a larger world and ecosystem. So clearly making networks of the institutions that can share resources, that can share human resources, infrastructural resources, but even more importantly, the cultural aspects. Because let's never forget that our success in science and technology critically depends on the culture or the cultural matrix under which we operate. Uh, you, it's not a great mystery for any of us to know that many colleges Okay, I have turned off the camera. Very much there. Okay, so you know, so let me conclude for the last question, saying that this is indeed required. Uh, that you know that uh, the 
uh, the bulk of our scientists and scientific institutions are totally empowered uh, to be able to undertake. So some of that has to be done by the college and the institution itself, which means that they need to have processes and architecture in place, which would encourage uh, doing R&D and innovation there. At the same time, the outside interventions which are required uh, are also being put in place. Okay, so it's about diversity and inclusion. Uh, if you you know if you were to look at the draft policy, uh, which I refer to STIP 2021, Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy, National Policy, uh, which parallels the National Policy on Education, that you see uh, that that you would have actually a very compelling chapter. Uh, on diversity, inclusion, and equity. And also this particular question that you refer to is about how to bring in mainstream. A whole lot of scientific institutions uh, which are kind of uh, feel left out. Okay, the next one, next question. Sir, how do we strengthen the collaboration between academia and the industry? In India, I don't see much projects that are well connected with the industrial projects. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So you see, then again, it's a multi-dimensional question, and this is something which is debated for many decades, many decades actually. You know, as long as I remember, uh, you know, working in academia in India, we have been debating this issue. The reason is there is not a single answer to that question. Let's start with the fact that the knowledge that we create. See, there are two different ecosystems at work here. One ecosystem creates knowledge. The other ecosystem consumes that knowledge. And these are not the same. It's not the same entity. So therefore, if we were to start, there are three aspects to this problem. Uh, if we were to analyze this. One is creating knowledge, which is pushable. Uh, creating knowledge, which has relevance and direction and quality. So I pointed out that India is number three in number of scientific publications. But if we were to look at relevance and quality, uh, we would not be number three, for sure. So if you were to see how much of this knowledge gets translated uh, and why it does not get translated, okay, uh, this is because a lot of our research is not driven by the needs which are there around us. whole lot of our research is driven by the fact that somewhere, you know, this great university XYZ is doing this kind of theme and problem, Okay. Uh, but, you know, then we become followers rather than leaders. So if you were to repeat what somebody else is doing, it will always be incremental and it would lack that understanding and punch. So therefore, one of the aspects of this is to, is, is to be connected uh, with our industry and our society and say, look, what is it that they are seeking? What is the need? What is the priority? A good understanding of that would create knowledge which is pushable. Now that knowledge also has to be pulled uh, by some stakeholder that would convert that knowledge uh, into new opportunity. Uh, so this is why, well, historically, our industry has not been very proactive in making use of new knowledge. But that is changing. So which is, uh, you know, very heartening uh, so that there is a greater pull for that knowledge if that knowledge had relevance and it had direction. In fact, we have seen this in COVID-19 time. Uh, what, uh, you know, when we didn't have ventilators, PPEs, N95, uh, diagnostics, and what have you, uh, we had nothing. But within two, three months, all of that, you know, very good designs of global quality could be created. How did that happen? It happened because there was a common shared purpose. Second thing, that the government, industry, and academia were working together. This includes the startups, right? So these are two essential ingredients uh, if we are to be successful in pushing our knowledge, as you say, connecting to industry, uh, right? So we could do that um, and, you know, keeping all of this in mind, that there is some responsibility for us to push knowledge, and there is some responsibility of society and industry to pull that knowledge to respect that knowledge, to have a healthy respect for that knowledge because it can create new opportunities. It is about, you see, uh, let me conclude by saying, it is a lot about uh, Lakshmi and Saraswati respecting each other uh, for their own good. 
uh, and so that developing that understanding uh, it is too important to be left only to one stakeholder of the society uh, and uh, well anyway it's happening and more of it has to happen again this is a question which has been discussed at great length in terms of policy uh, in the national policy on science and technology i mean creating incentives for example for both the parties you know what are the different incentives both fiscal and non fiscal uh, that could be provided for greater up uptake of knowledge thank you so much uh, dr shasha for uh, elaborating your views on the questions uh, uh, which have been asked especially the last two one which were not related to the policy and uh, uh, future so with this uh, we again uh, uh express our gratefulness to you for your uh, time given to us and uh, thank you so much for uh, giving such a wonderful lecture thank you very much thank you sir so with this we conclude this uh, plenary session and uh, since we are delayed by 30 minutes the entire day schedule will be subsequently this session that means we will delay by 30 minutes the coffee break and the lunch and subsequent session or everything will be delayed this uh, 30 minutes uh, from now so the plenary session so thank you for joining now we can have a cup of tea right and then after we assemble in a and b as usual